An ancient stone tablet is discovered, and decoding its secrets could rock a core belief of Christianity. It seems to tell the story of a messiah who is killed and rises from the dead after three days. Sound familiar? But this messiah may not be Jesus. This is one of the secrets of Christianity being unearthed by investigative journalist Simka Yakubovic. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. This is a photograph of a unique and mysterious 2,000-year-old tablet or stone. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Christians come to celebrate and commemorate the resurrection of Jesus three days after the crucifixion. This may shake up that. The stone emerged from the antiquities market, and incredibly, the ancient Hebrew text can still, for the most part, be easily read. The key line is this, I, Gabriel, command you, the prince of princes, in three days, live. Now, that may sound strange to the modern ear, but when I first heard about it, I almost fell off my chair. I mean, we're talking about a three-day resurrection. If it's referring to Jesus, this bit of archaeology is the earliest archaeological artifact that refers to him. If it predates Jesus, then who is this Christ-like figure that we didn't know about before? Who is this Jesus before Jesus? To decode the stone, we have to figure out when was it written? Where did it come from? And first, who is this Gabriel mentioned on the stone? In both the Hebrew and Christian Bibles, Gabriel is an angel whose main job is to announce the Messiah. In the Gospels, he's the angel who announces to the Virgin Mary that she will give birth to Jesus. On the stone, Gabriel is not speaking to a woman. Rather, he is talking to a prince of princes, code word in Jesus' time for a Messiah. So the inscription seems to speak of a Messiah who dies and is ordered by the angel Gabriel to rise again after three days. Until now, this has been associated only with Jesus. But renowned biblical scholar Israel Canole, who brought the stone to light, believes that the stone predates Jesus. Here we have, for the first time, an evidence, so the belief in the death and resurrection after three days of a messianic leader existed even before the time of Jesus. I can already hear some of the objections. What are you saying here, that Jesus was a copycat? And I must say, that's a totally unhistorical way of approaching the issue. If you think that Jesus was influenced by no one and he knew exactly where he was going and he landed like an alien from outer space, there's no point looking at any archaeology. But if you put Jesus in his historical context, first century Judea, he was, after all, a first century Jew, then you suddenly have to say, wait a minute, here's a man living in a country under Roman occupation. Clearly, he's going to be influenced by people and he's going to influence people. When it comes to this stone, now known as the Gabriel inscription, Canole's theory is that Jesus was influenced by someone since the stone predates Jesus. But does it? The answer depends on whether the inscription was written before the crucifixion. And to find out, Simca comes to the ancient city of Jaffa in Israel to meet with Robert Deutsch. Deutsch is an epigrapher a specialist in ancient inscriptions. He's also one of Israel's foremost licensed dealers in antiquities. So he should be able to explain how artifacts like the Gabriel Stone are dated. It has here a poster of the inscription. Deutsch is using a full-size paper copy of the stone, prepared by the academics who studied it. The Gabriel inscription is a very important inscription. The text is important. The development of the shape of the letter dates the piece. What do you mean that you can date it from the shape of the letter? It develops like a car. The shape of a car, it was never 
the same before, and it will never be the same after that. So you, if you find a car, you can say what year it was. Exactly. Like. This is typology, which is a very, very accurate tool. To illustrate the point, in the first century BC and early first century AD, the Hebrew letter Lamed, L in English, had a long neck and then lost it. During the same period, the kuf, or k, lost its little cap. And the mem, the letter M, initially square, became rounded, losing its squiggles in the process. Using these techniques, Deutsch agrees with Professor Canole, dating the Gabriel inscription to a time just before Jesus' crucifixion, possibly before his birth. And it dates to the first century BC and the beginning of the first century AD. So, the inscription seems to predate Jesus, but not by much. To hone in on a more precise date, Simca needs access to the inscription. But the problem is that the stone belongs to an Israeli collector, David Jesselson, who lives in Switzerland. Hi, Dr. Jesselson, it's Simcha. And he won't give Simca access to the artifact. Do you think I can say anything or do anything to convince you to let us just take a little look? Simca isn't surprised. He believes that David Jesselson is like many collectors who don't like investigative journalists around artifacts they've purchased from sometimes shady antiquities dealers. Well, okay, if you change your mind, uh, I think you have my email and... Simca is determined to see the stone, but since he can't get access to the real one, he's commissioning artist Dana Bendov to make him a replica using photographs published in scholarly journals. Since we don't have access to the stone itself, mm -hmm. this is a real one-to-one -one copy. Okay, so This I'm... stone, it's three feet high and one foot wide. Okay. And it's very, very, very unusual. It's got columns, it's got an incision. The letters are hanging from the lines. Mm -hmm. It's not inscribed, which is unusual for a stone. It's painted. Okay, with ink. With what ink. So what I'd like you to do, because that's what you do for a living, mm -hmm. is make me... Make me this. <laughs> make me this, exactly. <laughs> Building replicas is a highly specialized discipline, and the work begins right away. From the original photograph, the team of reproduction experts are using 3D computer and laser technology to recreate the multiple layers of the stone. From the painstaking carving process to laying on the letters, precisely as they appear on the original stone, making the reproduction as close to a perfect copy as possible. This should help Simca figure out its date, origin, and meaning. Though some have questioned Canole's reading, no archaeologists have challenged him. Simca now shows the reproduction to Professor Canole, who has moved beyond deciphering the text to decoding its earth-shattering message. In 2007, an ancient stone came to the attention of scholars that has the potential of shaking Christianity to its foundations. Dubbed the Gabriel Revelation, the text painted on the stone refers to a Messiah that lives, dies, and is resurrected after three days. The writing style, however, seems to suggest the time before Jesus. If the inscription is not referring to Jesus, who is it referring to? Who is this mysterious dying and resurrecting Messiah, and is he the original inspiration for Jesus and his followers? When the stone's existence was first made public, a few scholars, including Israel Canole, were allowed to study it. Immediately, they recognized it as a genuine artifact. But since the stone is now out of circulation, Simca has brought a replica he commissioned to show Canole. Does it look like the original? Mm, very much, very much. And look at this, look at the lines. Yeah, the lines, he did them very nice, yes. 
Where are the key words? Uh, uh, I just want to make sure. Here is the uh, Shloshet Yamin. In three days. Reading the Hebrew text, Professor Canole begins to decode it. For Canole, the key historical clue is a reference to three shepherds. I have sent my people, my three shepherds. Three shepherds. Canole thinks one of these shepherds living around Jesus' birth is the Messiah mentioned on the stone. Their story begins at the end of the first century BC with Herod the Great. Herod was appointed by the Roman Emperor Augustus to rule Judea and do Rome's bidding. He was a tyrant, hated by his subjects. Paranoid that a Christ-like figure would dethrone him, Herod is remembered in the Gospels as the ruler who killed innocent babies, fearing that one of them might be a messiah. When Herod died in 4 BC, his death triggered a messianic fever. Rebellion broke out on three fronts across the country. This was the beginning. This is the place where the serious rebellion started here, at this point where we, where we sit here now. Was this a nationwide revolt? Yes. Israel was literally burning uh, during this rebellion, yes. There were three centers for this rebellion, three messianic leaders, one Judah in the Galilee, the second one Atrongus in Emmaus, and the third one Simon from the Perea, from the area of Transjordan. Suddenly, our idea of the world that Jesus was born into seems very different from anything that we heard about in Christmas carols. I mean, this was no tranquil land with shepherds tending their flock and wise men following stars. This was a land riddled by political unrest and violence, rape, pillage, crucifixions, Jews against Romans. There was a revolution going on. And there were not one, but three revolutionary leaders or messianic shepherds one of them seems to have inspired Jesus. But which one? Could it have been a Trogus from a mouse, which is just outside of Jerusalem? Despite more than a century of digging here in Jerusalem, not a single Gabriel-like stone, not one, has ever been found. I mean, ink, painted on stone, anything that resembles it. Now that's very significant because archaeologically speaking, if you have a tradition of memorializing people on stone, then you find more than one. So the fact that not a single one has been found in this area pretty much eliminates a trongus as the dying and resurrecting Messiah mentioned on the stone. Well, that eliminates him. The next candidate is Judah. He operated in the Galilee close to Jesus' hometown of Nazareth and there is one archaeological site associated with him, a place called Gamla. Gamla was a center of revolt before and after Jesus. 37 years after the crucifixion, it was utterly destroyed by the Romans, never to be resettled. Simca is here with archaeologist Danny Sion to see if there is any Gabriel-like stone dating to the pre-Jesus Judah revolt. Immediately inside the gate, they come across signs of the final destruction. Essentially, you guys were the first to come in here since the destruction some 2,000 years ago. That is correct. The general of the Roman armies came here uh, leading three legions. Three full legions is no less than uh, 30,000 people. And then they brought up the siege machines and battering rams, and they used artillery barrage to bombard the city with ballista balls. Here's an example of one such ballista ball. This guy weighs about five kilos. These things are coming raining down on your head. Exactly, exactly. How many have you found of these? 2,000. 2,000? 2, 2, yes. In addition to the ballistas, they used arrows. We found at Gamla 1,600 arrowheads, which is probably more than all the arrowhead finds in all of Europe put together. But Simca is interested in earlier artifacts. Is there anything here related to the would-be Messiah called Judah of Galilee? As it turns out, in the period between Judah's revolt and the final destruction of Gamla in 67 AD, the people came back and rebuilt their city, except for one area 
which they left untouched. Simka and Danny head there now, looking for signs of the messianic leader called Judah. So what exactly are we looking at here? Sometime around about the death of King Herod, this area was completely and totally abandoned. So let me get this straight. This was a living, breathing place. And then suddenly, you know, like a volcanic eruption, it comes to a grinding halt. That is correct. But the bigger enigma is why nobody came back afterwards, because life went on around this area. People were living right around. Right around. Could it be that this place that we're standing is actually, a, a, in a sense, a monument to the revolt at the time of Judah? The timing is right with the death of Herod. And the reason that people lived around it but didn't enter it is because so many people died here, they didn't want to go into what, in essence, was a graveyard. That, that is certainly acceptable, acceptable proposition. Simka's convinced that Judah, the messianic leader who led the revolution, left such an impression on the people of Galilee that sections of their towns were left as permanent memorials. But no Gabriel-like inscriptions have been found in Gamla. So this leaves Simca only one candidate for the Messiah before Jesus. Simon of Perea. Perea is located on the Jordanian side of the Dead Sea. It is here that the most famous writings ever found were unearthed. They are called the Dead Sea Scrolls and are housed in a special museum in Jerusalem. Discovered in 1948, the more than 2,000-year-old documents are the oldest biblical texts ever found. When scholars first studied the Gabriel inscription, they were struck by the fact that it looked like a Dead Sea Scroll on a stone. The similarities between the scrolls and the Gabriel inscription are impressive. Both are written in ink. On both, the text is written in two columns, and both have the Hebrew letters suspended from the upper guidelines. All this suggests that the stone, like the scrolls, originates from the shores of the Dead Sea. So in search of a Gabriel-like stone in the area of Perea, Simca travels here to meet with archaeologist Constantinos Politis, who's been digging in this area for 20 years. Well, this is our dig house for the last 20 years, so we've got all our goodies in here, too. I'm, I'm excited about seeing the goodies. Please, after you. <laughs> wow, talk about goodies. Oh, my God. Well, I don't think mus museums have this much. Oh well, all this is going to go into the museum, but for the moment, it's in our storage. Pottery, mosaics, human bodies in the background. Are you serious? Yeah, there's about 50 bodies back there. 50? Maybe more. Yeah, this is really neat. Among the artifacts unearthed by Politis, Simca is struck by ancient Jewish and Christian gravestones, reminiscent of the Gabriel inscription. But these don't have writings. However, Politis has a lot more artifacts in his overflowing archaeological workplace. Well, there's a number of tombstones here. We're running out of space, so we just put them in this bathroom. But um, like these, for instance, so what is that? It's a marker above of the burial. Simca now understands that Gabriel-like stones can be grave markers. But everything Politis has shown him is inscribed, not painted, and written in Greek. The Gabriel inscription is written in Hebrew. Well, let's see what we've got under here. We've been here for a while, but... Yeah. <laughs> Look at that, my goodness. I have dust bunnies under my bed. We can pull out some of them. Let's see. They're up on the back. Yeah, it's a bit. Ah, here you go. That's a that's a Jewish one. Whoa. Very simple. Uh, no, it's faded, no. but this one is Hebrew. Politis now shows Simca several Gabriel-like Hebrew stones. It's a tradition of writing in paint directly on a stone without engraving, and it seems to be more common amongst the Jewish ones. We're here for a reason, and I think the Gabriel inscription seems to come um, from this area. We know that in the Dead Sea area, there is this uh, tradition of writing, uh, painting letters on, on stone. It's not unlikely that 
the Gabriel inscription could also be coming from this area as opposed to other eastern desert areas. By tracing the stone to Perea, the investigation seems to have linked the dying and resurrecting Messiah with Simon of Perea, the man who may have inspired Jesus. Only a few kilometers from where Politus has found his Gabriel-like stones is the exact area where Simon began his revolution. We're in an area called, in the land called Perea, which means in Greek, beyond, beyond the river, the Jordan River. How does this relate to Simon of Perea? Well, this is the land that he was in, and behind us we have this town of Macheres, which is where he was living. A Roman, Byzantine, early Christian town, very similar to some of the buildings that have been built here. Same stones that have been reused here, same type of architecture, more or less. So basically, when we talk about Simon of Perea, he might have lived in this village, and he might have lived in a house that looked not much different than this. Oh, yes, very much so. When Simon started his campaign, he seized this area first. It's a, it's a natural strategic point. So if you start a revolution, this is a good place to start it. It's defended naturally, and you have a very good viewpoint right across the Dead Sea to Judea, so yes. You read in Josephus that uh, Simon of Pereira led a revolt, that it was crushed. It's one thing. But when you actually see, you know, troughs, mills, houses, you know, when you connect with the everyday life of human existence, to think of how it looked like or felt like when people were killed and sold into slavery and raped and crucified, there's an emotional connection for me. The evidence is mounting that Simon is the Messiah memorialized on the stone and the man who may have inspired Jesus. But if the Gabriel stone did come from Perea, how did it get to the West? Simca now goes inside an illegal Jordanian antiquities market to find out. In 2007, Professor Israel Knoll drew the attention of scholars from around the world to a remarkable inscription painted on stone that refers to a Messiah that dies and is resurrected. The writing style seems to suggest a time before Jesus. The stone also talks about three shepherds, possibly three revolutionary leaders that instigate a revolution around the time of Jesus' birth. The archaeological trail has led us to one of them, Simon of Perea, modern-day Jordan. He was a would-be Messiah that died around 37 years before Jesus' crucifixion. But before we conclude that it is Simon and that he is indeed the model for Jesus, we have to make sure that we understand how a stone that originated in Perea, Jordan, made its way into the modern Western antiquities market. If he can trace the Gabriel inscription back to the antiquities market in Perea, Simca will be closer to linking the Messiah celebrated on the stone to the revolutionary leader called Simon of Perea. Here we are, we're surrounded by literally hundreds of thousands of robbed up tombs. And if you look at the entire area, the whole hill above us. All those dimples, all those holes in the side of the hill? Those are robbed out tombs, looters tombs. They come at night and they're digging quickly, but that, that, that hole could have several tombs underneath there. And it's basically people who live around here. The people are living on top of the cemeteries of that period, underneath the houses. When they dig the foundations, they found these things. And then when they sell one or two, they see they make some money. They maybe just walk a, a few hundred yards right here, dig it up and sell some more. Exactly. They get, what, a hundred bucks? They get whatever they can get. They might get $10 or they might get a thousand, but usually we're talking about small amounts compared to what the middleman are getting. Because the middleman is the one who sells it to some, gets out of the country. So. He gets out of the country illegally. He connects with the art markets in London and Switzerland and New York, and, and then he, the price goes up astronomically. How does the market work? If the Gabriel Stone was dug up in Jordan, how exactly did it end up in the living room of a collector? For an antiquity to be legally sold, it needs to have been dug up by an archaeologist, and its authenticity needs to be verified. 
As Simca has discovered, there is a vast underground commerce in illegal antiquities. Looters outnumber archaeologists and regularly dig up ancient artifacts, then sell them to dealers on the black market. How are you? Do you speak English? Our team now hooks up with one of those dealers. Transactions like this one take place in secret locations, as no one wants to be identified with this kind of illegal business. How much for this? 10,000. After buying artifacts from looters, dealers then sell their wares to collectors and tourists. But the whole thing is illegal. Uh, 15,000 GDs. 21,000 US. This works for small souvenirs. But what about more significant artifacts like the Gabriel Stone, which fetch a substantial price on the illegal market? To find out how the stone might have been smuggled out of Jordan, Simka heads back to Israel to see Shlomo Musayev, the world's leading collector of biblical antiquities. Hi, Shlomo. How are you? Good. How are nice you? to see you. Nice to see you. Musayev's personal collection rivals some of the most notable museums in the world. These cases hold just a fraction of the thousands of pieces he has purchased. Simka is astonished to discover that Musayev's collection also includes stones like the one Politis showed him in Jordan, the kind that bear a striking resemblance to the Gabriel inscription. Oh, oh this is beautiful. Yeah. They're painted. Yeah. Yes. You know what's amazing, though? They look to be all about the same thickness, and they're rough on the back. Yes, this is the, the Gabriel is also rough on the back. And it's smoothed down on the front. Yes, this is exactly as the Gabriel one. Musayev's stones come from Perea, once again suggesting that painted Aramaic and Hebrew inscriptions are unique to the region. He bought them from a now deceased dealer named Rahani. But how do dealers get large looted pieces out of Jordan and into buyers' hands? Rahani, I know, 45 years. Let, let me get this straight. A piece like this, right? Some guy digs it out of the ground, he gets it, he paid off people on the airline, yes? Yeah. And that's how it got to London. Yeah. And then he comes straight to you. Yeah. Since Rahani was the address for high-end archaeology that originated in Perea, and Musayev knew Rahani for 45 years, Simka decides to take a chance. OK, so what I want to know is this. Did you ever encounter a... Uh, piece much bigger, three feet high, the one that was recently published. I saw it, it is in Zurich. Uh, Rihani showed it to you? Shuri showed me. Why didn't you buy it? Because he asked me such a big price. How much did he ask for it? $200,000. $200,000. But what would you have been prepared to pay at that time? Hundred, and fifty. You would have paid 100, 150,000? Yeah. No more. Simka's now unraveled many of the stone's secrets. The writing style, the archaeology, and the way the stone appeared on the antiquities market all point to Perea as its place of origin. Simka has also discovered that a rebel named Simon came from this area and that his followers thought he was a messiah. Israel Canole believes that he has found strong textual evidence suggesting that Simon's followers were the first to claim that their leader rose from the dead. The argument centers on a word mentioned on the stone that is meaningless to anyone except a biblical scholar. The word is domen, which means dung. But Canole points out that every biblical reference to domen means one thing only, rotting flesh. Sar Hasarim, Domen Arubot Surim, Prince of Princes, and he in a, decomposed in a, gorge. in a gorge because those who have killed him did not let his body to be buried. Around the time of Jesus, the story on the stone seems to fit Simon and no one else. Simon's story goes like this. At first, Simon was successful. He defeated a Roman garrison and crowned himself Messiah. The Romans went after him with a vengeance, and they chased Simon into a Perean gully like this one. 
After a bloody battle, they decapitated him. To further demoralize his followers, they didn't allow them to bury his body. This is the very story Canole believes he has decoded on the stone. But really, this makes sense. I can just see a battle, right? They can come in here. A few people can, can hold off a lot of people, but they can get surrounded. So the leader wants to get a little bit of a better position, right? He runs up. He runs up a place like this. He's chased. He's literally met. He's surrounded from that side. He's decapitated. You know, he, 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 he falls. He dies in a place like this, you know? And then, you know, this body is all over the place. And then it's easy to guard so that the followers can't come to even bury their dead. Lying down here, you decomposing. Know, his body is turned into dung. Domen. This word is used several times in the Bible where somebody is not allowed to be buried. His body is stays outside and rats, like these animals that we, we see here. But if Canole is right, and Simon is the man memorialized on the stone, why would his followers continue to call him a messiah after his violent death? After all, a messiah was supposed to defeat his enemies, not be defeated by them. It is at this point that Canole's detective work becomes most controversial. We've been investigating an ancient Hebrew inscription written around the time of Jesus' birth that tells the story of a Christ-like figure who comes back to life three days after he's killed. Our sleuthing has led us to a man called Simon of Perea. Simon's followers believed he was the long-prophesied savior sent to free them from Roman rule. Every text in the Hebrew Bible that talks about this king is coming, he does two things. He executes justice and righteousness in the land, and then he goes and conquers basically the entire world and brings it all under the rule of God. I mean, this is the Messiah. This is his, like his resume, his job description. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that the reason Herod fortified these desert places is he feared more than anything that a native king might rise in Perea, in Judea, in Galilee, and have some sort of claim to the throne. Now, this is very interesting. What, what could some peasant, like a Jesus figure, even before Jesus, we've got a number of people that come along. They don't have an army. They don't have power. They don't have uh, the wealth or the influence of Herod. He could order uh, a 1,000 troops at any moment to do anything. What they have is this pedigree. If anybody is a descendant of King David and begins to get the religious call to say, I think I'm the one, there's the potential for hundreds of thousands of Jews to flock to this person and make him king. Thousands of people did flock to Simon's side. He was crowned king and declared Messiah, Redeemer. In Greek, he was called Christ. At first, Simon seemed to be a God-chosen winner. He led his followers to victory. But then, the Roman army defeated him, decapitated him, and left him to rot in the desert. At that point, according to Canole, Simon's followers did something revolutionary. Even after death, they continued to call him Christ. So actually, out of the gravest crisis, a new idea comes. An idea that see the suffering and the dying of the Messiah as an essential part of the process of salvation. It changed history. Yes, of course. In the next generation, this ideology will be picked up by Jesus. It will be a leading ideology for his messianic activity. And later on, the Roman emperor was defeated by this ideology. So it seems that Simon's followers turned this defeat into victory. The death of their Messiah, they said, did not disqualify him. In fact, his suffering proved that he was the Christ. 
According to Canole, this theological spin was made possible by arguing that all along, Scripture predicted not one, but two messiahs, a winner from the line of David and a suffering servant from the line of Joseph. If Canole is right, the Gabriel inscription, which is at least 400 years older than the earliest New Testament text, is the earliest document ever found mentioning a suffering savior. Now we have the perfect... The, the smoking gun. The smoking gun. The Messiah, son of David, and the Messiah, son of Joseph are appearing in the same line in this document. Two messiahs. Two messiahs. The triumphal messiah and the suffering messiah are both here. And it's the earliest reference? This is the earliest reference to a messiah, son of Joseph. The suffering, dying, and rising messiah. Pretty revolutionary. We've got a text now that shows us this notion of a suffering Messiah who's raised from the dead is already being developed within Judaism. So it's not something Jesus came up with. It's not something the disciples came up with. It's something that is beginning to develop out of the hard experience of the Jewish people, which is everyone we put our hope in is killed. Why is this happening to us? But if Simon was the original model for Jesus, this still leaves one important mystery to be solved. How could Jesus have been influenced by Simon? After all, one died in what is now Jordan, and the other lived a month-long journey away in the Galilee. It seems that the Gabriel inscription has been decoded it was probably a gravestone that marked the place where Simon of Perea was cut down by his Roman enemies. A reference to three shepherds or messianic figures led Simca to three revolutionary leaders that died at the time of Jesus' birth. A reference to one of them decomposing in a gully implies that the would-be Messiah was Simon of Perea. A further reference to the angel Gabriel suggests that Simon's followers believed that he was resurrected three days after his death. Finally, a reference to a suffering servant seems to be the first text ever found describing the long-awaited Messiah not as a winner, but as a loser. All these clues taken together point to Simon of Perea as the original model for Jesus of Nazareth. We have a new insight with this Gabriel text. It kind of nudges us toward the idea that Jesus, before he dies, is already anticipating, not because God told him in a miracle or because he's the son of God and therefore he knew everything, but he's struggling, wondering, where do I fit in? What is my role? What do the prophecies say about someone like me? And he begins to talk in these riddles that's throwing everybody off. And he takes his inner group aside. They have a talk about, is he the one? And he basically admits, yes, you've got it. I, I am the one. They're thinking, oh, then we're going to march down to Jerusalem, take over, armies of angels will command, and it'll all be over. And he says, no, no, no. I'm going to be spit upon and beaten and persecuted and killed. And then here's the key. And after three days, I'll live. Now, where is that coming from? I think it's probably unlikely that he took a little trip to Perea and read our actual stone and thought, oh, that, you know, I'll be like Simon. But what the text tells us is these ideas are in the air. They're being discussed. Where? Out in the wilderness, out by the Dead Sea, out in the place where messiahs come. But how would Jesus, who lived in northern Israel, have been influenced by Simon, who lived in Perea, modern-day Jordan? I mean, the two are 130 miles apart, a month-long journey in Jesus' time. Well, it turns out 
that in precisely the same location where Simon lived and died, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, lived and was beheaded. In order to fill in the last piece of the puzzle, Simca travels with Israel Kanol to Machaerus and Perea, where John the Baptist was imprisoned by Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas. Like Simon and Jesus, John the Baptist was preaching a religious revival that set him on a collision course with the Roman authorities. And it is here, in this stronghold, that John the Baptist lost his life. If we are asking ourselves, how is it possible that uh, Jesus got this ideology? Who was the link? How was the connection made? Between Simon of Perea? Between Simon of Perea and Jesus, because when Simon was killed, Jesus was probably one year old, two years old. He couldn't talk to him, of course. So the ideal solution would be either John the Baptist himself or, or other people around him. John the Baptist had a large following. Many thought that John was the long-awaited Messiah, but John seems to have deferred to Jesus. He even baptized him. Canole believes that John, who spent time in Perea, must have known Simon and believed in him. Perhaps after Simon's death, the Baptist brought Jesus into the fold. When Jesus came to John, he could listen and hear this ideology and be influenced by it. So really what we're talking about is that this world-changing idea of a suffering Messiah, a suffering, dying, and rising Messiah was born here. And that the link between this idea that grew up around Simon of Perea and Jesus may have been Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, who was beheaded right here. Yes. You got to ask, what shepherd or messiah was left to rot and die in the crevice of a rock around the time of the death of Herod? I mean, it's rare that we can do this. We can pretty well say, I think, this is this Shimon, Simon. And Professor Israel Knoll has solved a mystery, I think. At this moment of 4 BCE, the Romans thought, OK, we crushed this rebellion. We killed the messianic leaders. Simon is dead in Transjordan in a narrow valley there. At the end, but this will take time, Roman will be conquered by this belief, by the followers of this belief. So the Jewish Messiah wins out. The Jewish Messiah transforming to the Christian Messiah will defeat the Roman Empire. Some 2,000 years ago, Simon's followers came up with a revolutionary, world-altering idea. Namely, that a defeated messiah is not a false messiah. They argued that the defeat, the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of the messiah is an essential part of redemption. This idea that grew up around Simon in a desert like this is still celebrated in every church where Jesus is worshiped. But very seldom do you have a text that should just make front page news. And this text should. It's an absolutely pregnant moment of time where something is coming to birth that has never uh, been thought of before. And we've got a text for it. It's amazing.